What is your rich life? We can't afford that. We don't talk about money in this family. Uh, that's for rich people. We don't need that stuff like they. We have to understand the nuts and bolts of money as well as money psychology. Right, I'm super excited today to have with me Ramit Sethi. Um, Ramit, I don't know if I told you this, but you're a big inspiration as I went down my personal finance journey to sort of, you know, it was the first book I read um, and it sort of changed the way I think a lot about personal finance. And I still recommend it to everyone as a great place to get started. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You made my day already. <laughs> uh, I'd love to start from the beginning. If I remember way back at one point, you were almost a, you were a tech founder. You were in startups. What sort of made you kind of pivot into this life of, you know, talking about money? I've always been interested in the human psychology part of it. Like Roth mm -hmm. IRAs don't get me up in the morning. Yeah. Okay. There's a limited amount yeah. I can say about yeah. it. I'm like, yeah. go read chapter three. Yeah. But um, I remember my own psychology of getting college scholarships and taking some of it and putting it in the stock market. That yep. was like 1999. I think I was a genius. Yeah. Just like, you know, we've seen oh. those cycles come again and again. Luckily for me, even though I lost half of that scholarship check, I decided, okay, I better learn how money works. And so there I am learning how money works. And at the same time, studying persuasion, social psychology, risk, and realizing that most of the advice on money necessarily tries to drive to numbers. It's always about what's in cell C3. And it's like, let's keep a budget. And then you go and look at normal people. You go, do you actually keep a budget? They go, no, I hate budgets. So why don't we get real with money? Why don't we admit that like when we met recently in New York, we went to a nice coffee shop in Soho and you and I wanted to hang out. We didn't care that the coffee was like $7 or eight. It was a nice coffee shop. And we want to be able to create a rich life. But in order to do that, whether that means living in New York or whether it means traveling two months a year or even just picking up your kids from school every afternoon, we have to understand the nuts and bolts of money as well as money psychology. Yep. I love that. I mean, most... Even when I was running Teachable, we realized very early on that I spent most of my time convincing people they are worthy of, you know, their knowledge is valuable, they're worthy. And for whatever reason, I didn't realize it at the time, but we just spent all our time on psychology. I'm yeah. guessing now, I mean, when you talk to people, a lot of these beliefs, do you think there's something people form early on in their life? Or how do you think, how do you think this happens? Almost always. So I, I call them invisible scripts. Mm -hmm. And these are scripts that are so deeply held that we don't even realize they're there. That's why they're invisible. So you and me probably have some similar invisible scripts, just Indian culturally. Parents, Indian parents, yeah. yeah. So let, yeah. let me go out on a limb and guess. Yeah. Um, education is a good yeah. thing. Yep. Uh, in fact, there is essentially no limit to how much you should spend on education, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. even though we did not grow up together, we grew up in the same culture, very yeah. powerful. Um, marriage is for life. You don't yep. even entertain the idea of divorce, okay? I would say those are both generally pretty good invisible mm -hmm. scripts. If you take yep. them too far, maybe not, but generally you're pretty good. Yep. But let's think about some other ones, little phrases that people hear around the dinner table when they're seven years old. Maybe we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about money in this family. Uh, that's for rich people. We don't need that stuff like they do. And so imagine hearing any of these phrases, positive or negative, or however you internalize them, and hearing them a hundred times, a thousand times. What, what I discovered is you, we really internalize these scripts, and the way we feel about money is not correlated with how much we've got in the bank. Yep. That's why I'll talk to multimillionaires on my podcast. Like, they literally have over $8 million dollars. And they are worried about the price of blueberries or gas. Yeah. And, and you're just like, this is insane. But it's not. It's just human psychology. Yep. Yeah, I still spend time, I mean, justifying, you know, relatively small purchases to my mom. Even though I'm trying to explain to <laughs> like, rationally, this actually does not really matter. But it's, the programming is so deep. It's do you, deep. Do you believe people can change their money psychology? I do. I think that the stakes have to be high. I think there has to be a reason. So... Absolutely, people can change because I have seen them change on my podcast, even with one powerful conversation. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard f uh, because even though something may not be serving us, mm -hmm. human psychology is peculiar in the way that we would rather keep doing something that's not working yep. rather than try something that might fail. 
So we're comfortable with the failure we know mm -hmm. versus the failure, potential failure we don't. And so, for example, I will have people constantly anxious and guilty about money and I'll show them, hey, let's take a look at your money. Let me explain what these numbers mean. Yes, you have enough. And I'll show them the math and they'll go, oh, okay, okay. And it, it you can see that it's not reaching not them. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's because you can't reach an emotional issue with a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the primary failures of personal finance education. So yes, we need to show people what is the 4% rule and how does compound interest work? Absolutely, that's critical. You have to be f basically fluent in the language mm -hmm. of personal finance at a basic level. Yes. And we also need to show people that money is emotional. It's not a weakness. It is. I still feel emotions about money. You do. We all do. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just need to build the skills of managing those emotions. Makes sense. So I guess if you're, if you're working with someone, I mean, give me an example of how you would construct an emotional argument or how you would try and get them to change their, their worldview about money. And I've, I always I've seen you work with couples where they both have very different beliefs. And yeah, I like argument. that because I like uh, picking the hardest <laughs> yeah. uh, possible area to yeah. work. It's kind of like, you know, if you're a runner, yeah. you want to run in like a high altitude with a weight vest on, yeah. you know, yeah. I like that. Because then yeah. when you actually do it, it's easy. Um, I love working with couples. That's who I work with on my podcast. Um, and I always start with a very specific example. I go, tell me a time in the last 30 days where you were not on the same financial page. And I do that because it's very easy to start speaking in platitudes. He says this, she says that, we do this. I don't care about that. I want to know what happened when you went to Target and one of you picked up something extra in the car and it led to this huge fight. And, and I'm sitting there going, okay, tell me why. And I'm not uh, judging because yep. every couple has been in a fight. Yep. There's nothing crazy about that. And I say, tell me why. A lot of times, no one has ever asked people Why'd you do that? Uh, what happened? And so I get both of their sides. And then next, sometimes I'll say, hey, how'd you grow up with money? And so we go down. And a lot mm -hmm. of times, most of us don't even realize the connection between how we're acting like 30 years later yep. with money versus what our parents said one day when we were seven years old, yep. you know, out at the merry-go-round or something. Yep. And then, then we start to transition. This is where I, I really love it. I ask people, what is your rich life? Okay, for everybody watching and everybody listening, let's do this together. Yep. I ask him, what is your rich life? Well, should we do this right now? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, so what is your rich life? So for me, I mean, I really value experiences. I value, like, I'm, I don't care much for too many material possessions, but things I value spending time and money on is, is travel, is doing things that, like, my parents never had the opportunity to do, so I get to do that. I value spending time with my parents because they're getting much older. I've come to the conclusion that there's no amount of time I would spend with them where it's going to feel like too much at this at this point. Um, yeah. And the hardest one for me to reconcile with my parents is I value paying for convenience. If things save me time, <laughs> that is something that I will absolutely pay for. But they struggle with that. They struggle. Like, for example, they would rather drive everywhere to get a cheaper, like, loaf of bread or something yeah or like me paying money to like change a flight to a later date mm. is like the biggest waste of money to them but to <laughs> me but to me money adds optionality in my life and yeah. it's a tool for me to live the life i want my yeah. life is not a tool to make the most amount of money possible nice okay all right so for everybody listening uh, that was actually a very sophisticated answer the most common answer i get from about 90 percent of people is i want to do what i want when i want mm -hmm. And so um, I'll ask people, okay, that's interesting. So what do you want? And then they just stare at me like yes, yeah. just blinking. Yeah. And that's because most of us have actually never thought about it. Mm -hmm. We have only been told to shrink our dreams. Yep. No, you can't buy lattes. No, you can't buy nice yep. clothes. No, no, no. And maybe when you're 90, you can go take a trip. Yep. All right. Obviously, you've yep. thought- I should, I should caveat. Deep. I spent two years after selling my company, traveling the world and thinking a lot about what I want. So. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not surprised. Yeah. And yeah. You, you came to these conclusions. Yeah. Now let's do part two of this question. Yep. So part one is, what is your rich life? Yep. Everybody always says, I want to do what I want, when I want. Then I push them. And often we will get to something like travel mm -hmm. or convenience or freedom, or I want to become healthier. Those are yep. all great answers. Fine. I say, okay, you like to eat out. Mm -hmm. Great. That's your rich life. You want to go out to a lot of restaurants and try a lot of foods. Great. What if you could quadruple the amount of money that you spend on that thing today? Mm -hmm. 
right? So first I've asked them, what's their rich life? What do yep. you love spending on? Yep. Now I want to come back to you and ask you, what if you could quadruple the amount you spend on that? What would it look like and feel like for you? I mean, for me, I think it's, it, I guess, I think I'm a little bit different after, you know, having sold a business and stuff where at this point yep. money is no longer the limiting factor. And for me, the purpose of money early, I've just seen so many people who are frankly far wealthier than I am still get obsessed over they still spend their time stressing about money. And to me, the value of money was to eliminate that stress. If I don't have to think about money, it has yeah. solved its problem for me. I, I can't remember. Someone said it's the solved the money problem. That's how I feel about it, where I always feel more limited by time, energy, other things, yeah. not, not money. So you have a classic entrepreneur answer, which I love. You and I share yeah. a lot of similar things. Convenience is my number one yep. money dial, same as yours. Yep. Um, if I have a problem that money can solve, it's not really a problem. Yep. But to get to that level where you've sort of um, made peace with certain mm -hmm. emotions around money takes a long time and often more money than most people yep. Yep. are comfortable making, at least yep. at a young age. So what I'll ask people, you know, question number one, what's your rich life? What do you love to spend mm -hmm. on? And then question two, I'll ask them, okay, if eating out's your thing, what would it look like if you quadrupled your spending? This question mm -hmm. is very challenging and very fascinating to watch because if eating out is your number one money dial, the thing you love to spend money on, and you turn that dial up, most people have never thought about it. So I'll get answers like, well, I'd probably have to go on a diet because I'd be eating out four times a yeah. week. Ha ha ha. And yeah. I go, okay, that's funny, but yeah. think multidimensionally. Yep. There's more than just like, would you still be eating at Chipotle yep. four times a week? Maybe, but maybe it would be uh, like uh, this young man in DC who said, I have a list of every Michelin starred restaurant in DC. Yep. I'd love to try them. And I said, okay, I love that answer. It's very aspirational. Specific I said, too. Yep. Yeah, specific. Yep. Who would you take with you? And it got pin drop silent in this room in DC. He goes, yeah. I would take my parents because yeah. they could never afford to go to places yep. like that. And so with personal finance, at the entry level of personal finance, the goals yep. are always about what? And that's fine. What do I get? What do I want? I want to yep. watch. I want to travel, whatever. Fine. I love it. At the highest level of personal finance, as you illustrated, it's always about the who. Who do I get to take with yep. me? Who do I get to be more yep. generous with? And that journey is the beautiful journey yep. of creating a rich life. I mean, I feel very fortunate in a lot of ways that my family never grew up like super wealthy. So now after selling my company, I'm yeah. able to take them to things they never could experience. I have, I have friends who kind of grew up with money and for them, it's just paying for the same things their parents have already experienced. But yeah. being able to take my parents to like a nicer hotel than they've ever stayed at and stuff like that, it, it, it's, it's really rewarding. I kind of love what you just said. Uh, what a twist. You said, I love that I grew up, you know, without a ton of money in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, what a gift to be able to look at your upbringing yep. in that way. It reminds me of this uh, Navy SEAL who I heard on an interview saying, when other people do push-ups, they get tired. When I do push-ups, I get stronger. Yeah, And that awesome. framing, oh, it's so beautiful. I love that. I feel the same way. We grew up yep. very middle class. I had yep. to apply to scholarships for college. And now I look back and I go, wow, I know how to be frugal. Mm -hmm. In fact, I am frugal in lots of parts of my life. And we both have been given this gift of another layer yep. of a rich life, which is the ability to create experiences and memories. Do you worry about how you would approach that with future children? Or like, let's imagine, like we, for instance, grew up in a world where we've been able to sort of straddle both sides. Yeah. Presumably any future children, you know, will not have that. Do you have any any thoughts on, on how? Yeah, I, I already hate my future spoiled <laughs> kids. Yeah. I'm like, right? you, you little spoiled brats, you don't yeah. even exist yet. And I already detest yeah. you. No, I, I do. I think about it a lot. I talk yeah. to my friends a lot. I yeah. ask them how they do it. And I'll tell you one thing. So when I went to college, I had a lot of assumptions about um, just the nature of people because, you know, until you go to college, you pretty much live with your family. That's yep. what you know. Yep. So for example, I thought, because everyone in my family sleeps pretty well, like sleep yep. is not an issue. Yeah. So I just thought like, oh, if you wake up, no big deal. Just go back to sleep. Yeah. Nah, that's not true. Yeah. In college, you discover people get pissed if they yep. get woken up. Yep. Another thing I assumed, stupid assumption, was people who went to private school were spoiled. Okay? So then I went to college, yep. and I met friends who went to public, friends yep. who went to and private. And you went to Stanford, right? Yeah, I went to Stanford, and I had only gone to public school before. Yep. And I was like, oh, that was a really dumb assumption because yeah. there are people who work insanely hard yeah. from public schools, private schools, you, you know, it's not uh, correlative mm -hmm. to just be like, oh, they're spoiled. Yep. So 
that actually opened my eyes a lot at the young age of like 17 to realize that these assumptions I had about the world were just made up. Mm -hmm. And so I think now that even if you have means, if you're fortunate enough to be financially comfortable or even wealthy, yep. you can raise kids with great values, but it yep. takes intense amounts of work. Yep. That makes that makes a lot of sense. I think I had the same experience. Well, I went to, I went to Berkeley, but I saw a lot yeah. of my friends whose parents, especially, went through the whole dot com boom, and mm. they grew up objectively wealthy, but some pretty level headed kids. Not all of them. A lot of yeah. them are pretty messed up too. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's also the the Shaq quote, right? That you know, telling his kids that we're not rich, I'm rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. Oh my god, amazing. Yeah, yeah I think that um, you know, my wife and I, uh, we love talking to our parent friends and asking like, what's your, what's your policy? Like, how do you think about parenting? Yeah. What's your style? And I think this really goes back to a rich life. Like when I ask people about what is your rich life, a lot of people tell me stuff that frankly, I don't want to do. Yeah. I don't find it part of my rich what's life. What's an example? Uh, one of my readers retired in his mid thirties with his wife and they travel in an RV across the country. I'm like, I don't ever want to step in an RV. Americans love that. I, that was one of the things that surprises me where the like amount of people that don't want to leave the country, they want to travel, but they want to stay within the country and just stay in this like tiny van, travel all over and it's super romanticized. It's very romanticized. Like, I think I missed the book where, you know, it's like very romantic and stuff. And so I'm like, listen, not my thing, but I love that it's yours. And I love whenever I hear a parent or somebody who goes, you know what, I'm in, like, I recently heard someone who goes, my rich life is um, creating these miniatures. He like creates and buys these miniatures. Wow. I go, wow, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> and it, he loves it. Yeah. And I go, anytime you meet someone who has dialed in their life, mm -hmm. to me, that's very inspirational. Yep. That's awesome. I've been... I've been seeing, and what do you what do you think of the other people in the personal finance industry? I mean, again, like you know, you're very good about sort of the, the psychology of mm -hmm. of money. A lot of other people, you know, talk more about the numbers. How do you think about, I guess, the overall personal finance guru industry or whatever? <laughs> uh, well, when I started um, in 2004, there was a handful of people talking mm -hmm. about personal finance online. Yep. I mean, literally yep. a handful of blogs. Um, what has been absolutely amazing is the number of people who now mm -hmm. talk about money, whether it's on blogs, social media, podcasts. Recently, I went to a conference and I met, I mean, I met the people that I know, but there's mm -hmm. multiple generations of yep. people talking about money. I love that it is way more diverse than mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Uh, and I mean diverse by every measure. It's the way people look, where they're from, how much money they have, how they think about money. I love all of that. Uh, I think that ultimately, like I've given some speeches to people in the personal finance mm -hmm. industry. And the number one thing that I shared about my journey is I write for ordinary, normal people. Yep. And so that's why I read every email I get still, every yeah. comment. I can't reply to them all anymore, yep. but I read every single one. And it keeps me in touch because I'm not writing for the personal finance industry. Yep. I'm writing for people who are like, hey, what do I do with this money? Or how do I pay off this debt? And to me, that is still exciting 20 yep. years later. Yep, that's awesome. Would it be fair to say that the thing that you say that probably annoys people the most is their stance on home ownership? Or are there other other things that have quite as many people? I'm not aware that I've annoyed anyone in my life. Yeah. I'm not aware of that at all. I, yes, I think that uh, probably some of my most controversial opinions. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I don't even know why it's controversial. Let, let's talk about I, this because yeah. uh, the fact that I tell people very plainly, for the biggest purchase of your life, mm -hmm. a house, you should run the numbers. The fact that that is controversial shows yep. how much propaganda exists in America yep. to yep. buy a house. Yep. How ridiculous that people go, oh, Ramit, <laughs> you're saying you should never buy yeah. a house. Yeah. I go, uh, no, I said you should actually run the numbers because in certain places, like the place you live and the place yeah. I live, financially yeah. speaking, it actually makes no sense to buy. Yeah, but that's, a, that's an odd American of you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm un-American, exactly. Yeah. And then I go, uh, do you guys realize that this, quote, American dream of a white picket yeah. fence was created by the National Association of Realtors, which, yeah. by the way, is one of the worst organizations on earth. And now, yeah. first of all, all the realtors come out of the, oh, <laughs> Ramit, what are you saying? My commission? I go, Shut, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not taking advice from you. Yeah. A realtor is the last person I'm going to yeah. take advice from. Secondly, sometimes it makes great financial sense to buy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it makes great financial sense to rent. And and this is where I love it because I could afford to buy a place tomorrow yep. in cash 
and I don't. In fact, I have made more money renting over the last 15 years than I would have buying a place. And this blows people's minds because now these cultural invisible scripts of I'm throwing money away on rent. No, how, you're not. How are you calculating making more money from rent? Are you looking at the opportunity cost of money saved or how? Uh, yeah. So all if I factor in TCO, all the money I would have spent yep. on not only uh, a down payment and the opportunity cost of investing yep. that, but maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And just taking all of that money and putting it in the market, I made more. And that market, by the way, the fees on that are like zero, essentially and you're, zero. You're just factoring in like S&P standard market returns yeah. or whatever, not any special yeah. investments you may have. Nope. Access. I'm uh, Everything that I invest in these days, yep. like S&P 500 or target date funds, very simple. So really what I love about the home ownership yep. discussion is it goes deep. It's not just an invisible script of yep. me or you. It is around us. Yep. It is phrases like you're throwing money away on rent. You're paying your landlord's mortgage. By the way, isn't it funny that we never say that about you're paying that restaurant owner's mortgage? Yep. It's only associated the with a yep. landlord. Why? Yep. yep. And on and on. So I just want people to get smart about the biggest purchases of your life. You should be completely on top of buying a house. That means you should under, understand amortization schedules, interest, opportunity costs. You need to know this yep. stuff. You should do the same with a car. Mm -hmm. As for how much you spend on organic grapes at a grocery store, honestly, it does not matter. Stop yep. spending time on $3 questions and focus on the $30,000 questions. Yep. Yeah, I think it just ends up, again, like like anything else, for a lot of people, the house is part of their rich life and it's an emotional decision, which is fine. I mean, for me, I bought my house, but not because I think it's the best investment at all, but because I wanted to have a house and it was something I was willing to spend money on, so. There you go. Now, that is an honest answer. I love that. And I, and I love when someone goes, hey, Ramit, I ran the numbers. Uh, I live in New Jersey, let's say. And actually, it, like, it makes no sense. I'm paying way more in taxes, et but I want it my kids or the school district, or I just like to decorate my own place. I go, you know what? Fantastic. You ran the numbers, you can afford it, you understand you are paying more, but there's yep. more to life than just a calculation. Yep. And I see, I do the same thing in my life, right? I have areas where like this sweater, I could get a sweater that costs one tenth the price yeah. and you know, it'd be functional, but I want this. And that's one of the things that's important to me. I love hearing what's important to you. Yep, that's awesome. How, so, I mean, a lot has changed. I mean, I would imagine in your life since you wrote the book originally, how how do you manage your money now? I mean, do you still use the same systems you described, you know, a while back with larger dollar amounts? Has anything changed fundamentally? Uh, great question. So since I wrote the first edition of yeah. I Will Teach You Be Rich in 2009, a lot has changed. I got married. Yep. Uh, my personal net worth grew a lot. Uh, my business grew. And then also there were new tools. Uh, mm -hmm. Bitcoin was on the market. Yep. There's a lot yep. of new bank systems, et cetera. I wrote the second version of the book in 2019 and uh, I did account for some things that had mm -hmm. changed. Um, you know, essentially good advice does not really change, yep. but certain accounts, like I, I kicked them off my recommendation yep. list because I'm yep. like, you guys suck. Now. Like specific uh, providers, you mean? Yeah, not I name names yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. in my book, yep. which yep. I love. I learned it from Oprah. Yeah, um, she's like, this is my favorite. The upside is it's super tactical. The downside is you probably have to keep you keep updating it, right? Yeah, and I learned some because like the first time I wrote the book, I told people like, oh yeah, open these high interest accounts, you get five percent interest. Yeah, and then, and then for the next ten years, yeah, exactly. I got these angry yeah. emails. Ramit, where's the? And I go, okay, never again. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, what changed in my own personal mm -hmm. management? A few things. Um, I think uh, at a certain net worth. There is optimization to be had beyond target date funds. Yep. So target date funds are fantastic. It's what I recommend to my family. Super simple, yep. does all the work for you. At a certain portfolio level, you may want to consider individual index funds because there are minor tax optimizations yep. that can happen. And an accountant can advise on that, et cetera, or, or uh, an advisor, or yep. there's lots of tools out there. Um, uh, what else changed? I've had some help, like I've had bookkeepers who kind yep. of look over my personal stuff yep. and that has been helpful. But fundamentally, my personal finances, I have fought to keep them simple. Yep. I have a very limited number of credit cards, yep. okay? I have a very limited number of accounts. I have a very simple asset allocation and that is it. And life is simple. My life is not about optimizing yep. uh, 0.0001%. Makes sense. And do you manage it yourself? 
yeah, I manage it myself. Makes sense. And do you, so you have you still, do you still have an automated system where you put money in and, you know, it goes to the accounts in a certain hierarchy or whatever? And Correct. Correct. The minor change on that is because I run a business and so I have a salary that I pay myself. So mm -hmm. all of that is totally stable and automated. The only uh, major change with that automation is that once in a while, when I pay myself a distribution, mm -hmm. that might get treated differently because you cannot automate a distribution. Are you set up as an S corp? Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's kind of been interesting to me, again, as a relative outsider to this is how much of the tax code is written for two things. One is for business owners. There's just the playbook of what you can do as a business owner is just so much greater. And two is, I mean, clearly America loves real estate. Like anything real estate related, there's just so many incentives deeply built in the tax code. Do yeah. you spend much time thinking about taxes or do you think it's, it's just better to focus on making money? This is a it? great question. Yeah. This is a fantastic question. Okay, so I do think about taxes and I have thought about them and I developed my philosophy and now I don't think about it yeah. much. So f um, first off, I created a scale on one to 10. How aggressive am I with taxes? Yep. Like, what was your number? Uh, like 10 is Al Capone, all right? And <laughs> yeah. like, I'm two. I'm two. like, okay. I don't okay. care. Yeah. I prepay yeah. everything. Yep. I don't care about squeezing out because yep. um, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in personal finance is to let the tax tail wag the dog. Yep. So to me, it's incomprehensible when people make decisions when they move primarily to Puerto Rico, for when they tax. Move to Puerto Rico despite yeah, like, yeah. yeah, they're like moving to place. I go, you're rich. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Now, if you want to yeah. live there, fantastic. Yeah. But, you know, I highlighted this guy on Reddit's Fat Fire subreddit. Yeah. And he's like, I'm 27 years old. I have like 13, 18 yeah. million dollars. Like what low tax? I go, that is your yeah. level of creativity. Yeah. Like yeah. where is a low tax? I go, you're going to have over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it makes no sense. Now, um, p you, you have to remember that people's reactions to this are highly fascinating to me mm -hmm. because most of us have grown up with the propaganda that taxes are bad, yep. which I totally disagree with, and your only goal in life is to minimize taxes. If you deeply internalize that, then the rest of your behavior follows that. All you, the only lens through the world through which you look at is, how do I cut taxes? Yep. I'm like, that's it? That's the only way you look at the world? It's like yep. putting Tabasco on everything. Yeah. I love Tabasco, but you know, yeah. there's other hot sauces. Yep. So um, I am a two, I'm, I'm pretty conservative on taxes. Um, I definitely take whatever optimization I can. That's low hanging fruit. 401k, yep. of course. Uh, HSA, of course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have those index funds, some little allocation things. But like beyond that, um, I'm happy to pay my taxes. I actually feel fortunate to be living in a country where I can make the kind of money yep. I do. My team can get paid what they do. And I get to pay taxes. That to me is a gift. It's not a penalty. Yep. I mean, look, you, I mean, you moved from New York to California. So clearly you're not, you know, yeah. you're, not, you're not letting your, the tax decisions dominate it. Yeah. I mean, I facetiously tweeted once, I mean, what's the point of even having money if you have to live in New Jersey? Because a lot of people really <laughs> wanted to avoid New York City tax and it pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. why. Yeah. Okay, but that, but you know what? It's really cool. I, I, New Jersey jokes aside, yeah. it is cool that you, a successful entrepreneur who everybody knows, is raising taboo questions. Like, mm -hmm. should we always be trying to escape taxes? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe we should account for the basic low-hanging fruit, like 401ks, and then we should live our rich life. Like, maybe there's more to life than just cutting yep. as much off the tax bone as possible. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I th for me, again, I think the sweet spot is sort of what you talked about, retirement accounts and certain things the government yeah. gives you where... I think, frankly, at a certain level of revenue, you should know about them because you're leaving money on the table. But yeah, I mean, again, I've talked to some accountants. Things can get pretty sketchy with offshore stuff. And I don't know, yeah. our recommendation has always been not to do it. Peter Thiel had his whole Roth IRA that has produced so many questions. And yeah. my view is it's probably illegal, you know, the, the self-dealing nature of that transaction and all of that. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I've heard about like uh, easements and all kinds of stuff. I get texts from friends once in a while and they're like dude have you heard of this and yeah. I, sometimes i have sometimes i haven't and then i look into it and i'm like there's a lot here that seems really sketchy and sometimes i talk to my accountant he's like okay let me outline the ways that this will not work or it could go wrong and i go do i really want to spend the rest of my life chasing an extra 0.1 percent with huge mm -hmm. risk no yeah what what do you tell people like this so i have a lot of friends for instance so again they're wealthier than ever 
ever could be but still sort of approach it with a scarcity mindset yeah. of like in in my in my opinion they they've like won the game but they they're still spending as much time stressing about it so what's the point yeah like um i'm going to guess probably we know some of the same people and uh it's like constantly optimizing for frequent flyer points yeah. and i'm yep. like stop doing yeah. you are too wealthy to be doing that yeah. you actually cannot afford to do that yep. anymore yep um still agonizing over going grocery shopping because mm -hmm. it's like another thing they have to like, why are you going to the grocery store yep. dude yeah and um first of all i don't tell them anything because unless they ask yep nobody wants to be told like you're doing it yep. wrong i think that uh i think a couple of things i think one um, leading by example. So for example, my wife and I travel a lot. It's one of our money dials and we make it a point. Um, we travel like months per year. We try to take these sort of cool um, trips that are meaningful to us. And sometimes I'll post about it. And I was torn about whether to post about it or not. Like I'm not posting the, like I'm on a yacht. Yeah. It's more like, like I'm a hotel guy. I love nice hotels. I love yeah. the details. Like yep. really yep. deep. So I'm like, uh, my Instagram stories have like two pages of text, you know, they yeah. break, they're yeah. like the worst stories, yeah. but I love them. I, uh, I try to share what is meaningful for us and for mm -hmm. me, um, knowing that like most people don't want to stay at those hotels or they're not going yep. to or travel for that long, but at least they can say like, wow, if this guy's doing that, like, should we maybe take a weekend trip? Yeah. Uh, and I think that I have been inspired by other people who showed me what they do, not in a yep. show off way, yep. but just like, oh, this is possible. Yeah. yeah. And this it is... made me go, wow, we, what if we did that? So this is not just the Punjabi and you trying to, trying to show off the vacation. <laughs> no, Dude. Uh, well, I mean like what, what do, what, what, oh, I know what it is. Where do they post the pictures from? Uh, what's the beach town that everyone from India goes to? Um, in, Goa, in Goa, Goa, yeah, and, yeah. and there's one other place. Um, no, I don't No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, no, but that, that, that's interesting. That, that, that's a spin on sort of modeling the behavior you think other people, other people should model because yeah, I have friends for whom literally the only thing that will change is the money they go to the grave with, right? Like you're already past the pointless. point where, where there's, there's nothing really that changes. It's pointless. Um, like wh what's the point? That's, this is actually what drives me. Why I started my podcast is like, okay, I speak to people who have $800,000 in debt. They have yep. their own challenges, but I also speak to people of $10 million and you know, you have to th realize like most, the vast majority of people have never heard a couple with $10 million talk about money. And I have them share every yeah. number. I have all yeah. their financials and we put them on screen. Yeah. So they're sitting here saying like, oh my God, like one guy, I love this. He goes, yeah, we were driving somewhere in our neighborhood and somebody had a free baby car seat. So I stopped and got it. But the problem was it was broken. So now I have to go to Home Depot and I go, dude, are you kidding me? Yeah. And he has like $8 million. So what I love about these examples is it shows people a crystal ball into their mm -hmm. future. Most of us think like if I just had $10,000 or $50,000 or $5 million, everything would change. And the truth is, uh-uh, you're going to feel the same way about money unless you work on your psychology. That makes a ton of sense. Have you... And I guess through the process of doing this, how have, have your, has your psychology evolved around this? Or I think, any, any things that are different now than what you expected starting out? I think I'm more compassionate. My wife has even told me, well, she's more compassionate than I am, just like definitionally. Yeah. And uh, like, she, it, it comes naturally to her and I've had to work at it for like 20 years, yep. like every day of my life. Yeah. And um but she she listens to the podcast and even in our conversations because we talk about money regularly yep. um it's a lot softer mm -hmm. it's a lot less tactical mm -hmm. and that to me like i'm i'm happy to hear that because it's hard it's really hard for me to do that um i think that i've um i've realized also i've accepted that some people will not change Mm -hmm. Or it may they may take their own journey. They may take years. Yep, that's okay. And finally, this one has been eye opening for me is like as somebody who knows money. Yep, I I used to expect that if somebody comes to me for help, they want to go from A to Z. They essentially want to know as much as I do. And of course, that's totally wrong. Like nobody wants to yeah. do that. I have a I have a personal trainer. You think I want to read the same stuff he reads? Yeah. No, I want to go. I want to go from maybe A to F. And yep. call it a day, like yep. round of applause to myself. Yep. I trained 
And that's what people want with money. They don't want to be deep in the weeds. They want to make sure they have enough money to live and not run out and maybe go on a nice trip once in a while. That has been, it's so obvious saying it now, but it took me about a decade to figure that out. Yep. That makes, makes a lot of sense. I think. What I, have you realized? I'm curious now, uh, in your work, both, uh, with like as an entrepreneur and also with money, what have you learned along the journey? Yeah. So for me, the first thing I realized is how much I did not know, like even the very basics, because in my family, we never talked about it. I was never taught it. So even whatever little money I was fortunate to make, I didn't put it in the market. I held it all in cash, like from a tactical basis. So that's the part that I guess I didn't know. The parts that I feel good about is I think I look at, you know, after having money and how it's changed my life. And I've seen some other friends and how it's changed their life. I think I've managed to be somewhat level-headed and in, in no small part, thanks to the sort of upbringing I have where, yeah. you know, I, it's managed to keep me pretty grounded. Um, but at the same time, again, I'm, I, for me, it was just money's always been a tool. Again, you know, I said this before, money's a tool for me to like live the life I want. I, I don't look at my life as a way to make the most amount of money possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I have friends that are just, you know, going a very, very different path and have tried to like lightly, you know, bring them back. But yeah, that's. Maybe, uh, what do you think would happen if you invited those friends on a trip? What, uh, would, what would happen? I think they would, again, be the friends that are, val like, they're also the ones who wouldn't understand why after making a certain money, amount of money, I wouldn't want to also flex that lifestyle. Mm. And again, that's something that, you know, I think there's a certain amount of money I'm happy to spend because it helps me. It's, it's, it's the things I enjoy, but yeah. I would never, you know, fly private just, just to tell people I'm flying private or, or go that extra steps. A lot of these people, mm. I mean, they look at, they're probably direct playing a status game and they're using mm. money as a tool for that status. Well, you know, that's not a, not a game I'm trying to play. Got it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. It's super fascinating. I, I love this stuff. I love it at every level of personal finance, right? If you're in 250 K of debt, if you're making 60 K for the first time ever in your family, or if you have multiple millions of dollars, it's just absolutely fascinating to watch how people think about and talk about and behave with that money. Yep. At what, I mean, it looks like at this point you found this to be your life's work. At what point did you realize this was your life's work? Um, I think about a few years into writing, I was just writing my blog as a hobby. I wasn't making a cent, but I was loving it because I had commenters mm -hmm. and I, I really thrive off people coming, uh, writing comments, positive, negative. I just love the feedback. And I started to have a lot of fun with it. Like first I was yep. developing my own philosophy. Yeah. And once I knew my systems, it's like, it's like anything. It's like cooking. You know, you get good at the mechanics and then you start to throw in your own style. And I'm like, oh, I can tell stories. I can tell jokes. I don't even mind if someone's trying to troll me because, yeah. you know, they're not good at trolling yeah. anyway. And this is actually fun. So that I think a few years into is when I realized I could do this forever. That's awesome. I mean, th it also seems like you're authentic, you're authentically being who you are. A lot of people, you know, strip away the personality from it. I mean, you're no bullshit kind of say it like it is, which is pretty rare, pretty rare in this world. I appreciate it. I think, uh, it, it means a lot to hear you say that. And I've heard people when, when I go to events, sometimes, um, sometimes I have some of my colleagues with me and afterwards, uh, they'll, my colleagues will come up and they'll be like, Oh, the number one question we got is people come up to them and they'll go, what's Ramit really like? <laughs> I go, I've been doing this for yeah. 20 years. How yeah. long can you fake something? Yeah. You know? I mean, do you cons one, do you consider yourself a creator or like in the, you know, as a creator, do you ever, do you ever burn out? I mean, you're still mm. in a lot of ways, the personality behind all this and you've tried to build a business around the brand, but I would imagine you're still so integral to it that, you know, the, the business doesn't really work without you. Does that tire you? Uh, it's a great question. So when I think about uh, creators, I think that there are a few different dimensions they can optimize their business along. So one of them is explosive growth. And you see people raising venture money, and that is one path to go really big, really fast. Totally yep. respect it. Not my thing. The second is they can go super deep. And that is creators like my friend Patrick McKenzie, who mm -hmm. writes yep. this newsletter about banking. Yep. and It's so super dense. Deep. Yep. Super deep. And like, that's what he does. And he loves it. He's great yep. at it. Yep. And then there's also longevity. So people who stick around, stay mm -hmm. fresh for years yep. or even decades. 
And that's really where I like to live. And and when I thought about that, I realized it actually matches my investment style perfectly. Yep. St- live to fight another day, low fees, stick around, yeah. stay relevant, right? And so for me, I realized, for example, that in the early days, I needed to become crystal yep. clear on the mechanics of IRAs. And I did. Mm-hmm. And I wrote the book and I go, here you go. Now yep. I don't want to talk about that anymore. So I have reinvented into a adjacent but different part of money. It's all about a rich life and its relationships. You can imagine travel and a variety of different things. I think that um, if you are doing something and you want to be around for a long time, you have to find a way to stay excited, number Mm -hmm. one, and number two, relevant. And if you can do that, I and with a lot of luck, like I've had, I think that you could have a good shot at sticking around. Yep. So I'll take that as overall you've managed, you don't feel burnt out, you feel you feel good and sort of sustained the energy over the years or has it ever Yeah, been well, there have been times. Definitely there have yep. been times, even like uh, over a year period where I've kind of been like, ah, I'm not really feeling this. I remember at one point my team, uh, I wasn't talking about personal finance so much. I was talking a lot more about business and yep. th- they were looking at the analytics and stuff and they're like, hey, you need to talk about money more. And I was like, I don't want to. And then yeah. you know what they said to me? They're like, um, you need to find a way to get excited about personal finance again. Yep. They literally told me. Yep. So I was like, yeah. damn. You know, <laughs> you think as CEO, you're telling everyone yeah. what to do and it's totally yeah. not true. Yep. So I remember I went away for about four days and I was like, okay, I have a blank page of paper. I have a mission that has been given to me by my team. Let me just jot it down. And I would say this was around 2016, 17. Yep. I sat there and I started writing, what would I want to talk about when it relates to money if it was, uh, if I have to get excited again? And guess what? That's a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today. It's relationships and money. Mm-hmm. It's um, psychology of money. And I even had a column called like Big X, what do I not want to talk about? Yep. It was the stuff I already wrote about for Roth, 10 years. Roth IRAs. Roth IRAs. Whole, yeah. Like, no, yeah. I don't want to talk. And, and so for me, the, the solution there was someone first had to tell me like, hey, you need to do this. Yeah. And second, if you're creative enough, I think you can usually find a way to stay excited, but you may need to give up some of the stuff you used to do and you may need to chart a new path. Yep. And I think the fact that you're not venture backed and you kind of run this in the way that the business is yeah. for yourself. So it can be an extension of how you are feeling and what you want to do in, in the minute makes it a yeah. lot more sustainable. Totally. If I were venture backed, it would be a totally different story yeah. and I would not be able to do it. The fact that I'm hundred percent bootstrap gives me a lot of luxury. It yep. gives me a lot of time. And I always wanted, after doing a venture backed business in Silicon Valley, I realized I want to run a boutique business that operates the way I want it. And, and I vividly remember, I used to live in San Francisco. There's a sushi restaurant there up in the marina. And uh, it was very difficult to get into. So you had to be yep. there by like six o'clock and put your name yeah. on the list. So one day I got in and I walk in and I'm like, wait, th- there's hardly any tables in here. There's like yeah. five tables. Yeah. Instantly as an optimizer, I'm like, well, if they added yeah. seven more tables, they could increase yeah. revenue. And then I looked around and I'm like, they yeah. really don't give a shit. Yeah. They're yeah. doing it their way. Yeah. Like, no online thing, yeah. put your name. Yeah. And I go, what an inspiration to yep. be able to run your business your way. Yep. No, that's awesome. It's like, reminds me of a street vendor I know in India. He would work like three hours a day and his food would sell out. And I'm like, like you can make more food. And he's yeah. like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I get to yeah. work three hours a day. Like, this is what uh, I want. Yeah. I love that. Just to, just to have a point of view, to me, having a point of view is the rarest thing on earth. So it, it's a point of view with yep. your business. Like I know you have yep. now doing yep. it the yep. second time around. You have a very clear, yep. what am I going to do? What am I not? Yep. A point of view with your money. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm not going to do. Not everybody has to agree with your point of view, but at least you have one. And I find that incredibly rare and incredibly valuable. Yep. At least for me, it was a confidence thing. The first time around, I just figured... I didn't know stuff, so I should listen to these other people that I yeah. thought knew more. Then you realize no one knows shit anyway. <laughs> and then you realize what I think probably matters because, you know, everyone is winging it. But for me, that's what it was. Yeah. The first time I just thought, I thought I had to do performance reviews. I thought I had to do one-on-ones. I thought I had to manage and lead a certain way because yeah. that's what people on Twitter said. And then I realized no one fucking knows anything. And You know, you're totally right. And I, I will say... Um, It is kind of refreshing to be brand new at something, especially after doing it for so long. Um, You know, like I, I recently filmed this show for Netflix Mm -hmm. and I've never done that before. Yeah. And so I'm like meeting all these people and getting 
the fire hose of information yeah. and I could recognize it in myself like, okay, I don't know what's right or wrong. Yep. I don't even know the rules of the game, but I've done a new game before. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself in the best possible position. I'm going to write down every lesson I learn along the way. Yeah. And then in the future, I will be a little bit smarter. And honestly, like it's pretty humbling to be yep. brand new at something because I'm used to doing what I do and being good at it. Yeah. Uh, but it's also it's also refreshing. It makes you realize like, oh yeah, it's not that scary. You can do this. Yeah. Tell me tell me more about the Netflix show. How did that come about? And and yeah, what was the experience like? Well, I never like thought I would do a show. Yeah. Like I'm an internet guy. I like yeah. to be on the internet. I respond to trolls. I make some jokes. Yeah. And like I have an email list. And then like it's like okay, cool. That was a good day today. Uh, Netflix, uh, approached me and they knew about me and, um, uh, they had said like, Hey, we're interested. Are you interested in doing a show? And I actually said, wow, this is very flattering. Uh, let me talk to my wife and see this is me being compassionate. Yeah. I realized I got it. It's the, yeah. two, of it's the two of us. Love You're you, team. babe. You're a team. And so, um, she really encouraged me because, you know, I, I will say I was nervous about the fact that on the internet. I can control my programs, my mm -hmm. social media. Yep. I know exactly. But this is a whole different level. And she encouraged me. You know, she's like, hey, I think you're ready to take your message to a bigger audience. And the fact that I've been doing this for almost 20 years, I did feel really good about, I know the dynamics. Like I, I've yep. seen the patterns. So uh, started the process with them, uh, developed a pitch and started filming and like, Wow, I, I've done film stuff before. Like you and I have both done stuff yep. where there's a studio. Yep. Uh, this was a whole different level, like a whole different level. More, the crew was, you know, it was a large crew, yep. extremely professional. And we went all around the country to help individuals and couples with different money problems. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about did, it. Did they find the couples? Did you, did they source? Yeah, how much, how much of it was, did you do versus, versus them? They, there's a casting department um, yep. and I gave input as to like, what are the characteristics that make a good person or people to talk to? And, and that, that took a lot of education because, you know, I've been doing this for a while yep. and TV folks have been doing what they do. So yep. we had to me have a the meeting of the minds. Of the yep. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to find the right narrative and, and all of that. And have you had a chance to see the, the finished product yet? I have. I have. And, and how do you um, feel about it? I feel good. I feel really good. It is, um, it's amazing because on my podcast, I get to sit down with couples once for a few hours and it turns into a one hour conversation. This is over a period of oh, weeks. Oh, that's awesome. So you get so you to see, see changes. You see it develop. You see it develop. Yes. Yeah. And that is amazing. Uh, and you see different people in different situations in different cities. And what, for me, what I love about it is that nobody wants to sit there and watch a spreadsheet. Nobody, including me. Yep. I don't even want to watch yeah. it. I'll turn this shit yeah. off. But to watch people and their stories and how they talk about money and treat money and sometimes ignore money, uh, there's nothing to me more fascinating than that. That's awesome. Can't, can't wait to check it out. Um, and with that, so what's what's next for you now after, I mean, again, you've been doing this 20 years. Yeah. Um, you have the Netflix show out. What, or yeah, that soon Coming out, out on yeah. April 18th. Yep. Yeah. What's, yeah what, what's next for you? I want to continue showing people all the different possibilities for a rich life. So money is the foundation of that. Mm -hmm. But like w once you understand the mechanics of money, you don't have to, you shouldn't have to wait 40 years to live it. You should be living a rich life today and tomorrow. So if that's travel, if that's fitness, if that's simply reaching more people and showing them the philosophy, that's what I want to do. That's awesome, man. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been a blast to have Loved you. Loved being here. Awesome questions. This was a lot of fun.